Good morning, and a very warm welcome today to the chapel of St. James Episcopal Church here in Danbury, Connecticut, for our service of daily morning prayer, right to, for January the 24th, 2021, the third Sunday after the Epiphany. And a reminder that our annual parish meeting is going to be happening next Sunday, that's January the 31st, starting at 11 a.m., after our 10 a.m. coffee hour is finished, following our usual 9 a.m. worship together online. So do please encourage your fellow parishioners to attend this important meeting in the life of our church with you, and reach out to our parish office if you have any questions about connecting in to that Zoom meeting. And in our e-news this coming Friday, you're going to find our full annual report as an attached downloadable document. So I do encourage you and ask that you look out for that email this coming Friday that I'll send and read up between Friday and Sunday on the year that has passed at St. James and all that awaits in our plans for 2021. And so in thanksgiving for that church that has been, that church that is, and that church that shall be, let us pray. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. We continue together with a portion of Psalm 62. For God alone my soul in silence waits, Truly, my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my safety and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in him always, O people. Pour out your hearts before him for God is our refuge. Those of high decree are but a fleeting breath. Even those of low estate cannot be trusted. On the scales they are lighter than a breath. 
all of them together. Put no trust in extortion. In robbery, take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it. That power belongs to God. Steadfast love is yours, O Lord, for you repay everyone according to his deeds. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nivea, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nivea according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nivea was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nivea shall be overthrown. And the people of Nivea believed God. They proclaimed the fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. The Word of the Lord. We continue together with Canticle 16, the Song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from 1 Corinthians 7, 29-31 I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with Canticle 21, You Are God. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the Eternal Father. All creation worships you. 
To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. This past Wednesday, at just before noon, something significant happened to me. It was something that I had suspected was going to happen one of these days, one way or another. It was just a matter of how and of when. And no, I am not, in fact, referring to the inauguration of the 46th President of the United States. No. No, I'm talking about a phone message that was left for me on the parish office line, coincidentally almost at the exact same minute that the new president was being sworn in. And this message was blunt, and it was direct. The caller had been a member of St. James ever since her baptism many decades ago, but she now wanted to be removed from the mailing list for the weekly letter from the rector that I send out every Friday. And the reason was that she felt offended. Offended that I had been calling her a white supremacist and racist when that was not how she had been raised. And she said she had been raised not to see color, but just to see people. And so she wanted to hear no more from me as she was considering transferring to another church. And so I did as she asked. But of course, 
this story doesn't really end there, never does. For all the rest of Inauguration Day on Wednesday, I, I had that call still playing on a loop in my memory. I wondered about how this person that I've never met or spoken to, how, how she felt so personally and individually and directly targeted by something that I had written in my letter to the congregation. So I went back. So I went back and I looked over the letters of mine that had broached that topic of racism. And I suspect that, that the offense may stem from some of the broad statements that I've made to my fellow white people. Statements about the way that we white people, we tend to get the benefit of the doubt here in America. And we mistakenly assume that the same benefit is afforded to everyone, regardless of race or color. Far from a, a criticism of any particular individual, I would say that that, that sort of a phenomenon is, is not even uniquely American at all. It's not even necessarily unique to people of European descent. Now, throughout human populations around the globe, whenever you find before you a majority group, the tendency is for the characteristics and the qualities of that majority group to be the norm there, to be the standard, to be kind of assumed the neutral position. But the trouble is, the trouble is that members of that majority of the population, they usually only become aware of other points of view, other perspectives, other experiences of life, when their eyes are opened by members of the minority. When and if they are permitted to speak, when and if they are allowed to be heard. So say the sociologists. So say the anthropologists. And so says the Bible too. As I turned to these scriptures that were appointed for today, I heard echoes of those truths about our human nature, about our relationship to calls for repentance on the one hand and that act of amendment of life on the other. To Jonah, Jonah you see, he was perfectly happy staying right where he was, there among his fellow Hebrew people. Right there where he felt he belonged. Right where he was comfortable. But God had other plans for Jonah. See, the people of Nineveh, an Assyrian city, they were behaving in a way that was offensive and unacceptable to God. And they were going to finally pay the price for that wickedness, those sins of theirs. But first, first God instructed Jonah to go and to give them a warning, to call out those powerful Assyrians, to tell them about the catastrophe that they were careening towards, and how they themselves, and not any outside force, they themselves would ultimately bear the responsibility for their own downfall. And what did Jonah say? What did Jonah do? Did Jonah sing out, here I am, Lord? Is it I, Lord? No, no. And more than that, Jonah's action said, no way. Jonah, he physically tried to run away from God in order to pretend that that distressing call never came in in the first place. Jonah fiercely and keenly wanted to avoid that prophetic task of being the bearer of unwelcome news. So much so that when he was out on the run from God and the ship that he was on was getting beaten to pieces by stormy seas, why, Jonah actually volunteered to have one of the crew members throw him overboard 
into those deadly waters. All because he didn't want to deliver the inauspicious message that God had for the Ninevites. But nevertheless, perhaps in part thanks to a three-day timeout there in the belly of that giant fish, perhaps due to that experience of being vomited out upon a beach. Nevertheless, eventually, Jonah said, yes. Or perhaps something more like, fine. But Jonah summoned the courage to walk through the gates of that great and prosperous and comfortable city where he knew he did not belong, where he knew he wouldn't fit in, that he wouldn't be received. And he went in and he told them something that they did not want to hear. But wonder of wonders, God be praised, it appears that Jonah's speech worked. The Ninevites, from the king all the way down to the animals, they all collectively repented. Repented for the wrongs that they had done and the rights that they had left undone. Their eyes were opened by this foreigner, by a stranger, by a minority of one. Opened in ways that only the words of an outsider could. They amended their ways. And we are told that God changed God's mind about their grim fate. Now, scholars, biblical scholars, argue about why this little fantastical book of Jonah, four chapters all together, why it became a part of the Jewish canon of scriptures. But I suspect that it's at least partly because that final detail, that final detail that carries so much of the theological weight of our entire tradition, that detail, that truth, that one voice, from just one voice, Speaking God's word, it can and it does have the potential to set a whole nation onto a path of right relationship with God and with one another. Now given the events of this past week, you may be wondering at this point if I consider myself just such a voice as Jonah for our own times. And the answer is no, not really. I'm just a priest with an email list and a YouTube channel, getting myself into what I hope to be good trouble. You know, if there's a parallel, I'd say I'm probably more like a member of the Ninevite priestly class. Because when it comes to proclaiming God's word on social justice and racial equality, when it comes to boldly naming with particular concrete examples the systemic privileges of whiteness in my culture, my society. I'm really just an amplifier. An amplifier of the words that I have heard from the Jonas that God is inspiring in our midst. People like Jonah, like John the Baptist, like Simon and Andrew, like James and John, people who at great risk to themselves spoke out. They spoke up about the need to make real and deep and lasting changes. Changes that were stunning and frequently unpleasant to hear, but changes that turned out to be the very best news of wholeness and peace and salvation that the world has ever known. And no, that did not always go smoothly, never has. In fact, the apostles of Jesus, they all paid a dear price for carrying the good news out into the, from the security of their own communities, out, out into the greater world. John the Baptist, he was beheaded. Simon and Andrew said to be crucified. James died by the sword. The only one of that group that we think died of natural causes was that apostle John. And that was only after surviving a dunk in boiling oil as punishment for the gospel, according to legend. But all of them share in that one common point, that one experience. They all listen to the voice of a stranger, an outsider, 
a mysterious wandering bachelor named Jesus of Nazareth. And they were so transformed by their experience of God in Jesus that they were willing to leave behind all that they had ever known, to reassess all that they had ever been taught, to reconsider all that they had assumed, to re-examine all that they had done. And then to choose what beliefs and values and convictions and priorities they were going to preserve in which they were going to change. Now, was that process at times painful and emotional and confusing and filled with doubt? Absolutely. But by enduring to the end, Rest assured, why they felt salvation drawing near. That sensation of a life being transformed into alignment with the will and the nature and the love of God. That transformation, that change, that is the good news of God in Jesus that we Christians seek for ourselves and that we share with those who are far off and those who are near. And on those days of discouragement, if and when we feel within us or, or we encounter around us a, a resistance to that kind of change of heart, that change of soul, that change of mind, well, then let us remember, let us take comfort, let us, let us find courage in this story of Jonah. For truly, truly, I tell you, if even God can change God's mind, then maybe, maybe, so can we. Amen. We continue together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, 
Keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nation and the world, 
that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your whole heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray especially for Robin, Charlotte, Brenda, Ellen, Chris, John, Irene, Dom, Roberta, Mark, James, Michael, Brad, Bobby, Susan, Larry, Emma, Aubrey, Joanne, Roja, Judith, Karen, Albert, Vivian, Dakota, Harry, Betsy, and Shirley, and for the special intentions on our prayer wall. We pray for those who have died, and we offer thanksgiving for the birthdays of Rita and Emma. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That, in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. We continue together with the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church 
and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.